गुड मॉर्निंग व्यूअर्स वेलकम टू दिस यो इंटरव्यू ऑफ मिस्टर सुबीमल भट्टाचार्य जी मिस्टर सुबीमल भट्टाचार्य जी इज अ साइबर सिक्योरिटी एंड अ डिफेंस पॉलिसी एडवाइजर he advises corporations institutions and government bodies on this issue and uh, sir has also served as a country president of the general dynamics india which is a major aeronautical and defense manufacturer of the united states uh, sir is also an editorial board member of the cyber journal of the prestigious chatham house london he writes regularly for the national newspapers such as the indian express and the economic times and uh, he is also a documentary filmmaker so sir we are really glad to have you today thank you sir good morning and to all of your listeners yes sir so sir before we move to the agenda of this interview we at geostrata have a dedicated center for strategic studies where we research on india's defense capabilities and beyond that and india recently tested the supersonic agni 5 missile with mirv capabilities so sir as a defense expert and someone who has been in that industry what do you think about it nisar you see the effort uh, to go a uh, full stream around a lot of aspects of defense and the strategic sector in the last few years is very very significant from a point of view of where global uh, geopolitics stands and is getting shaped and the instability that is coming in i think uh, we need to be able to do a lot of things ourselves to be in control of a lot of things ourselves so in the whole scheme of things uh, this recent launch is also very very important because it gives us certain capabilities that remains with us and doesn't make us uh, you know dependent upon others however friendly they might be uh, every friendly nation also takes its decision based on its own strategic interest so we as a large uh, nation with a lot of aspirations and uh, having a significant uh, i would say strength on what drives the next round of uh, you know innovations and capabilities even for weapons and equipments it is technology the digital technology and all things around it so uh, we cannot uh, stay away and hence we are taking steps at the right time and this is you know one of those uh, aspects that gives us far much more strength capability and hence uh, strategic importance of course so sir uh, moving to the agenda of this interview and uh, given the fact that you have been following the course of such knowledge intensive industries and capital intensive industries for more than two decades now so now what is your assessment of the current state of the semiconductor policy in india see uh, for the last 6 uh, 7 years uh, there has been a very close look but for the last 5 uh, years you can say post covid uh, this has been a focus of the government and also of the industry and the gap that has come uh, globally because of various uh, geo strategic scenarios the emergence of the quad the looking at Uh, you know a uh, critical and emerging technologies uh, the importance around semiconductor chips uh, it becomes uh, you know very very important and that is where uh, integrated circuits and uh, and uh, you know it's the other name for the chip uh, the focus on that to do something within the country is uh, very very important the policy incentives started from uh, 2021 december if i might say uh, has given actually the real philip and uh, you know as we all realize that the uh, uh, idea was to start with you know uh, product linked incentives uh, so that you know global measures also coming as well as uh, within the country uh, some uh, good companies with strength emerges uh, in this sector so i think uh, you know the way it has been pursued since december 2021 till day it has been very consistent it has been on the upper curve and as you have seen you know a lot of uh, things uh, have been announced now what remains very important is to see that the implementation of all of these announcements you know not only the three that uh, 
the prime minister inaugurated uh, three days back and it was cleared by the cabinet on the 29th of uh, Feb this year. But there are a few more, as the IT minister mentioned yesterday, five more are on the anvil. So whatever part of the semiconductor ecosystem that uh, is being attempted, everything has to be implemented well. Everything has to ensure that uh, the skills and the capacity also comes up parallelly. And this becomes a sustained business activity uh, so that you know, uh, a kind of a shift and a kind of a fear that arises from the China factor around the chip domination. I think, you know, we can take advantage of that. If you look at the uh, actual situation on the ground, it's almost, uh, you know, Taiwan, South Korea and China almost cover 90% of the, you know, chip ecosystem uh, uh, in the world. So there is a definitely a risk involved that you know everything is concentrated in one geography, and then there, if one of those uh, countries, you know, whom you know, I, I without mentioning, shows his belligerence on and off, it creates global fears. And then, of course, there are other things around, you know, bugging and uh, uh, you know trojans and everything that remain in the command, and also those chips themselves become. Uh, you know, points of insecurity. So in all of that, I think we had to take steps. We had to take baby steps, but we needed to take steady steps. And this is what the government has done. And globally, the industry, the industry players, all of them has seen merit in the way India is uh, proceeding uh, on its uh, semiconductor journey. So I would think, uh, you know, it's a good start. So, sir, you mentioned that we are building an ecosystem and not just focusing on one single industry. So, all the policy actions are dedicated for that building that ecosystem, which is self-sustaining, which mm -hmm. is from the end-to-end -end manufacturing, you can say that's what they say, right? So, uh, coming back to the ecosystem aspect of it, the government is also providing access to the design tools to the key universities in India, working right. on the semiconductor research. There is also a cheap in program announced to help the fabulous startups in accessing the EDA tools, which are really expensive tools that not yeah. a, sta a, a startup cannot afford. So government is giving them access to it at a subsidized rate. And uh, as you said, the IT minister, uh, Ashwini Vaishnav, uh, announced that the next policy actions in the semiconductor industry in India will be focusing on the fabulous sector, on the cheap designing sector. So how do you assess the situation of the cheap design firms in India right now? Well, I think uh, the chip in is a very good program to bolster the strength around skilling. Um, uh, so I would think, you know, for example, right now about uh, 10,000 students from uh, 120 academic uh, institutions and 20 startups uh, are involved in that. And by and large, uh, you know, the, the provision of the state-of-the-art EDA facilities to this student, as you mentioned, it's a very uh, costly investment. So I think this is uh, uh, a right step. Uh, so I think the way the various engineering courses in the country are running through a large number of, you know, mushroomed uh, uh, engineering colleges, uh, when it comes to looking at uh, employment opportunities also, this is something that they should focus on. However, they wouldn't have the resources as such to invest uh, even if they want. And in many cases, as you know, these engineering colleges are just uh, getting out uh, graduates uh, with not really quality uh, enter. So I think chip in will be able to cover a gap of this sort in uh, two ways. So it's a good step. The question still remains that it has to be done on a far much uh, larger and faster scale. Because if you are putting up uh, uh, so many of these uh, industries, you know, let's assume the uh, fabrication units or the AT MP, you know, facilities, everything in the ecosystem we are now trying to Target chip design has been happening in India for quite uh, some time. Many of the global majors have all, all, already uh, facilities in Bangalore or Pune to do that. You know, uh, uh, many companies uh, 
you don't know even you don't have heard that they are doing this in india you know i can mention about you know athos of france one of the best companies in the world in high performance computing 40000 people in india and uh, you know working on that similarly nvidia uh, again the best company right now if you see in terms of uh, market capitalization in the us and around the artificial intelligence sector has uh, pune as well as uh, sorry uh, hyderabad bangalore and pune where a lot of work is happening around it so i think uh, others have picked up now when the indian government has uh, come to incentivize more investment in that area uh, we will have to uh, create that pool that is able to you know uh, satisfy the requirements of the industry so both quantity as well as qualitative aspects can be looked in by a chip in kind of an and and hence chip in kind of uh, a scenario that is how i would uh, see and the best part is that it's not only only looking at the uh, engineering institutions it's also looking at the uh, startup community and by and large india today has one of the largest startup communities and a very vibrant one so i think we will be able to cover a lot of the gap uh, with such an approach yes so for our viewers the whole chip ecosystem consists of the three major parts so first is the designing ecosystem then there comes the manufacturing ecosystem and there comes the assembly ecosystem right so the government of india is trying to nurture each and every of these ecosystems to create the end of end to end manufacturing in india itself uh, the chips that are manufactured in india should be designed in india should be manufactured in india and should be assembled in india if we play the cards right in that phase so sir coming to the manufacturing the state governments have also chipped in with the subsidies as a complement to central subsidies of india semiconductor mission the 76000 crore outlay that the center is giving for manufacturing in india chip manufacturing in india so uttar pradesh and gujarat are competing hard to get maximum semiconductor manufacturing in the respective states and uh, uttar pradesh has gone far to uh, declare a semiconductor industry as an essential services which it indeed is so how do you assess the strength and weakness of each state in attracting the manufacturing investments in the semiconductor sector uh nisar one of the very uh, important uh, points we have raised here you know, two states uh, gujarat and uttar pradesh uh getting into this area and really giving the incentives is so heartening because not necessarily you know other than a good you can say good in gujarat's case it's a great uh, industrial uh, atmosphere a lot of companies have come prospered there is uh, you know available to workforce people are oriented towards workforce the concept of bans hartals or trying to not work optimally those things are missing uttar pradesh is just uh, coming up there's a lot of land there's a lot of barren land that can be made available for uh, giving out to industries including the you know you, you see the lucknow defense corridor also so all of that uh, i think these two states uh, have jumped into this whole uh, semiconductor manufacturing or even 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 you go beyond into the ecosystem uh, very rightly uh, so i would think that whatever incentives they give um, definitely would be looked at uh, positively because uh, india is uh, being seen as a, uh, you can say an quality destination for semiconductor uh, manufacturing or packaging uh, assembly testing design all of that so i think if uh, in one of those corridors also Uh, so gujarat you already see in sana then dolera uh, three entities are already named and will start functioning uh, microns uh, uh, facility is already uh, up there so question is that even in uttar pradesh uh, what pace it will pick up it will pick up because it's uh, you know people, there is land available and people need a good uh, tract of land for this so incentives uh, definitely fine uh availability of uh, you know raw material and all and and the whole in the whole manufacturing process not uh everything is really confined to the state it is an international supply chain game so 
uh, if even if you look at uh, Gujarat or Uttar Pradesh, both have their respective, uh, you can say, transportation corridors today to be able to do it. So I would think uh, rightly, you know, they have chosen this area uh, for investments and uh, uh, attracting the global measures also, apart from many of the Indian uh, companies also who are uh, getting into it, this bandwagon. So what I feel is Uttar Pradesh has that demand uh, demand appetite for the semiconductor. So already there is an uh, industry base in Uttar Pradesh that demands the chips and uh, getting the semiconductor manufacturing in that state helps them in cutting the costs down since they had to import these chips from outside and manufacturing them within the Uttar Pradesh will be helpful for them. But Gujarat may lack that uh, the manufacturing base that demands uh, these chips, other than the automobile industry. Gujarat has a good automobile uh, manufacturing base, but not in the strategic uh, industry. So that's I, I would tell also, or I would add this up a little bit here also. You have made a very valid point that you know the uh, kind of chips uh, that would be manufactured uh, still wouldn't be at the very high end of uh, you know what goes into the strategy sector they will still be for mass scale and large usage kind of a chip so uh, while uh, you know a local market or proximity uh, could be desirable but it really in the overall value chain it really doesn't matter whether the ch chip being manufactured in uttar pradesh is actually meant for you know some other geography in uh, you know some other country around the world uh, so I would think that, and secondly, you know, the availability of fresh water is also a very important uh, point when it comes to manufacturing. Uh, things. So even Uttar Pradesh should have better uh, possibility availability of fresh water compared to Gujarat. But uh, all these things, the investors uh, would definitely do the due diligence and uh, have already done and are now uh, taking the steps. And the state government, of course, as a facilitator definitely answers all these uh, concerns much, much more credibly. So like the chips that are demanded in the retail sector, such as the uh, consumer durables that we use and what is used in strategic industry, it's completely different. All right, absolutely. You know, the wafer size, you know, every time, you know, you look at it, you know, it's, it's a differentiator, you know, the number of transistors that can go into a, cheap mm. uh, that's the game that's the geopolitics game that uh, americans and the chinese are also playing and it's not only uh, you can say denying to china but someday it might be denied to many other countries also because that is where a small chip uh, flies a fighter jet and uh, as also runs your you know refrigerator for iot yes so uh, we talked a lot about the manufacturing of chips. Uh, co let's come back to the designing of it. So the governments of Odisha and Tamil Nadu are emphasizing a lot on their ability to attract global chip designers to invest in their states. Uh, Tamil Nadu by far has a great human resource base in VLSI engineering. Uh, and it also homes the IIT Madras, one of the center of excellence in semiconductor research. And uh, there are many other universities that have a promising electronic in, uh, engineering course in Tamil Nadu. And Odisha has come up with a dedicated fabulous policy, like no other state said from what I know, uh, no other state has a dedicated fabulous policy. They all talk about the electronic manufacturing or uh, manufacturing of the chips, just, uh, just like Uttar Pradesh and Gujarat. Has. But a fabulous policy that's really unprecedented. So do you assess this policy actions of these two states are enough to create India-based designers who are able to create a product differentiation that has a great market value for the world, not only for India. I think it will take quite some time, you know, to gain that international credence. Uh, I think, you know, Odisha has taken uh, some steps uh, looking into the future, uh, but uh, the market dynamics, the comfort of availability of skilled manpower, the uh, comfort that you can give to you know people who would uh, relocate to those facilities uh, to be a part of the uh, design uh, ecosystem and all those things would matter very much so far uh, except that uh, uh, there has been a chief minister who has been able to be popular even more than you know four decades 
sorry, two decades in power and going around uh, everything. And today, Odisha has the highest uh, rate of employment in the country. But this is a completely new area, and uh, this will require a lot of uh, comfort uh, to generate. For example, if you take the story of uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, or Pune today, from a point of view of software development or anything around the tech industry, I think those are established now, globally established location. But when it will come to Odisha, it will still take some time. However, the government would have done an assessment where the whole fabulous uh, uh, ecosystem is going by. Even if you see today, so let's take a, a company like NVIDIA and all. You know, it, it, it's the best company in the world. Uh, you know, its chips are uh, one. Yeah, they are the, yeah they, they, they just, they are the ones who started the GPUs and everything. But they, they don't manufacture. So there's one of the largest fabulous companies you have. So. Uh, you must see whether you know Nvidia would have an interest to go and uh, do something up there, or they are pretty happy what they are doing in uh, Hyderabad and Bangalore. So there is a dynamics that will play within the country. There is a dynamics that will also play externally. Uh, it's good in to have in terms of policy, but I would still think that uh, uh, somewhere uh, the states all have to coordinate also to see. Uh, how things happen. That's where I like the whole approach in which uh, the recent, uh, you know, the cabinet decisions and went where, of course, Gujarat got two, but a place like Assam also got one, which nobody would have thought of. Yes, of course. So, uh, since you rose the Assam question, from what I know, you are very articulate about the Northeast politics, which is reflected in your columns you write for Indian Express. And uh, as you said, Tata announced an ATMP investment in Assam, which honestly I didn't see coming. I, I didn't think that Assam has an uh, uh, appetite for attracting such investments. So there is a lot of interest getting generated by the automobile manufacturing as well to set up their greenfield investments in the state of Assam, who who are one of the greatest uh, consumers of the semiconductor chips, right? So is it time that state government of Assam also comes up comes up with a dedicated policy framework for such intensive industries? Oh, definitely. I think, you know, in the case of Assam, there is a much greater story than only that uh, ATMP facility being set up by Tata at an outlay of 27,000 crores in a place called Jagi Road, about uh, one and a half hours drive from Guwahati. Now, there were two Hindustan Paper Corporation mills in Assam, one in Jagi Road and the other place called Pachgram on the other Barak Valley. Okay. So they were uh, closed about uh, five years back uh, because of various uh, you know reasons and all. But there is a huge factory shared land, everything available. An industrial complex was available. So with a little bit of uh, modifications and uh, whatever work the Tata thinks uh, it needs to do there, Jagi Road becomes uh, absolutely re readily available place in terms of, uh, you know, setting up something large. Mm -hmm. Two, there is ample uh, facilities in terms of, you know, industrial uh, uh, atmosphere around Jagi Road. First, the roads to Guwahati are very good. There's a port in uh, Guwahati, you know, Pandu port, which is close by. Um, and as you mentioned about the automobile manufacturing also going there, so this could be something. The other thing, Nisarg, is that the government is very actively promoting actist policy, uh, which means to connect to the South uh, East Asian countries. A little bit of troubles in Myanmar for quite some time is uh, delaying things. But uh, with Bangladesh, the relationship has been improving and a lot of <coughs> business and trade are being looked at. Now, this is something that would immediately look at that market also. So I would think that these are uh, very, you know, you can say a quality business uh, indicator that that possibly is there. But there's another larger story in the case of Assam where perception about the state was al always poor because of uh, you know, militancy and young people extortion and all those things. 
Now, when young people could get trained and go and do the, you know, jobs in uh, such facilities, uh, definitely, you know, that is going to add to a lot of comfort uh, where, you know, you come out of uh, something wrong and you're getting into something. Good. These are some of the things good and Tata uh, consistently, whether it's the tea industry or other things have always, uh, you know, tried to play that part when development was uh, taken over or given the edge over only security and uh, stuff like that. So I would think that uh, this is a very, very uh, good move and strategic move by the government and Tata's involvement definitely adds a lot of stability to the whole thing. Yes, okay. So um, I think that emphasis on the supply chain resilience that Foreign Minister Dr. Jay Shankar makes in his public engagements really resonates with the tech CEOs and the key decision makers within the semiconductor MNCs and not the semiconductors, even the other knowledge intensive industries other than semiconductors. So India becomes that key destination that provides that policy stability, that political stability, that such greenfield investments need, right? So, but do you think that this foreign policy narrative is enough to attract new investments in industries such as semiconductors? or the market fundamentals, the local demand, uh, the, uh, as well as the local ecosystem, the local supplier base, equally matter for attracting such investors? I think it's a mix of everything. Of course, uh, you know, keeping tech in foreign policy and diplomacy is a very, very uh, pertinent step and uh, has to be taken or had to be taken as the government has taken. Now, India has the advantage, if you see Nisar, in the tech sector, for more than uh, uh, four decades, India has been exporting uh, software and services, and also India's uh, talents have been globally in almost all the top uh, measures, who today are also investors in the semiconductor space. So I think there is a certain degree of uh, credibility and acceptance that the global industry community uh, has about India compared to many other countries. Now, when you have a base which is much above a normal uh, base, you are not starting from scratch, but you already know technology, you laid around technology, you built up a lot of the system, you are a part of the various design programs. And I think uh, India as a destination uh, was uh, definitely attractive. Now then comes, you know, the opportunity under which such things can come. So I think just around COVID and the America's uh, push around uh, uh, China on the tech space, that that created a certain kind of a, a concern that you cannot be looking at uh, only having you know China and uh, Taiwan uh, having all of that, you have to spread your risk somewhere. The spread of risk uh, and taking it almost everything away to uh, Europe really didn't uh, work out in terms of the business dynamics. So you have to go to other places now. Where India stood in that, yes, India's base was already elevated, as I told you, when it comes to tech space. And how was the manufacturing sector taking up? In the uh, concerns that America and many of the other, uh, you know, NATO allies and everyone started having around China, they also started looking at the fact that how can they uh, shift steadily their manufacturing base out of China? So what are the destinations that could come up? Of course, India was there, but others like Vietnam and Philippines and all, uh, they uh, conducted themselves better. But then they are small uh, countries. The size of availability of skill, manpower, capital, everything was still very low. And their base on the sector was uh, definitely also not uh, commensurate uh, with what would have been seen in India. And of course, to that, when you already have a thrust and support uh, on policy on the manufacturing, when you already have an elevated base and all, next you use your foreign policy and diplomacy to, you know, go around and uh, in the geopolitical 
realignments that has been happening. You know, quad is was one example where critical and emerging technology was always a priority area. And likewise, you know, with Europe, uh, India signed an agreement on semiconductors also on November 24 last year. With Japan, there is an MOU there. So everywhere, the action on the ground uh, was uh, done in a far much uh, faster way, and that is where the external affairs ministry played a good role. Now, subsequent to that, whatever has happened in terms of uh, you know the steps being taken and whatever has been set up, and I think it has uh, been a very very uh, good uh, practice. A lot of people didn't believe that you know India could have uh, done something like this. In the earlier efforts also were there. But somewhere it came out that ultimately there was you know no market for that number of chips or india didn't have the real manufacturing or design capability but now things have changed because the large guys people who dominate the industry uh, have come and they have also understood the geopolitics the need for spreading uh, the risk all of that all of that taken together i think uh, you needed uh, tech diplomacy, you know, to be played even for the semiconductor chips factor. Uh, okay, going back to semiconductors, uh, the outlay of rupees ten thousand crores that the center has announced recently for developing an AI ecosystem, just like how we are creating the semiconductor ecosystem. So, but given the fact, the reality is that our semiconductor outlay is not that much of a force that can. Uh, uh, service the AI ecosystem as well. So, is it too early to announce such an uh, policy outlay, or is it at the right time? I don't think it is too early. I think uh, the pace at which you know AI is uh, moving ahead, and the concerns around AI that is coming up. So, you needed to look at uh, AI also very much closely. And uh, I mentioned about Nvidia a couple of times. Very, very, when you look at it. It's competitors nearby and where is uh, the uh, you know computing going uh, in uh, or what is the pace and speed where computing is going and the pace at which it is going it always needs to be backed up you know with uh, the availability of the chips and then where does that chip go and what purpose it is used for is mostly today around most of the large language uh, modeling that uh, you know defines uh, AI or even more you know generative AI that is coming. So I think uh, I don't think it is uh, absolutely early. I think we need to parallelly go on that because uh, as uh, the current uh, president of the global. Uh, a partnership on artificial intelligence and the deliberations that are going around to look at AI and everything and all. India also has a certain leadership role on a strategic front globally. And hence, it also has to have matching domestic activities going on. A much number of AI activities or, or work is happening even uh, in India in the private sector and all. But are they only for the Western world, and why? You know, why shouldn't we, we be looking at even building building up our domestic world? So to come to your question, uh, I think uh, the timing is uh, absolutely right. We need to look at where you know the applications of AI go, where these chips enable us, uh, you know, to go up the value chain in the semiconductor ecosystem, and then you know further. Uh, the find the application with AI in the different domains in which you know we are prioritizing AI in the country. You know, agriculture, education, all of these areas uh, definitely have a lot of uh, function capabilities that need to be working at a far much you know better speed and uh, you know if I may use the word optimally right now. That is where they go hand in hand. The context in which I asked you this question was that. You know, Open AI has also announced that it wants to get into the semiconductor manufacturing business. So just imagine an entity such as Open AI also gets into the game of semiconductor. That will be like a, a disruption within the semiconductor market. 
like till now nvidia was fulfilling that need of gpus that was used in the machine learning and uh, deep learning that open ai used to do in its lab but if open ai itself starts uh, designing its own chips as well as manufacturing its own chips that will be like a big thing after the pure play foundry model that esmp found so yes that's true that uh, we india also needs to get into the ai game as as soon as possible yeah so i mean but, yeah. uh, to you know to this point that you made open ai getting into this space if you look at you know even intel which uh, went uh, back for some time now is uh, again coming back big time with investment so everyone sees even in the us they gave the incentive president biden's uh, in incentive to the semiconductor manufacturing sector if tsmc is uh, just getting its uh, plant up at uh, phoenix um, so the difficulties say that they are also facing there you know in terms of stuffing skilling all of that that they have done they have sent people from taiwan to go uh, if you try to compare them with where we are you know i don't see much of a, a difference you know i think we have people who can be skilled and uh, trained and properly oriented to be uh, on the job right from day one even for the moriga plant and the jagirut plant in assam tata has already undertaken a skilling exercise and so i think we are in a position to uh, look at that and uh, whatever competition comes up in this area also globally india will have a uh, role to play much of the nvidia's works or the intel's work happens out of india in the chip design and related activities so you talked about the tsmc fabrication plant in phoenix arizona so we also interviewed uh, mr abhishek singh uh, he is an account executive to tsmc uh, he works for asml and right now he is in the phoenix arizona he, he told us that what is happening right now is what they call friend shoring like till now these industries were focused were concentrated in one geography but now they they are looking for other geographies that are friendly to the united states in the west and uh, they see that as a springboard to further expand that uh, supplier base so that's true that uh, it's a time for india to get into this game so make be it semiconductors as a, as well as the ai ecosystem right so we are moving to the last phase of our interview since uh, you, we promised you one hour uh, your career trajectory is really inspiring for the geo strata community where there are many students from varied interests uh, like we have students from engineering biology social sciences political science international relations i'm one of the guy who has studied international relations as a subject matter uh, as a formal education right and there are many others who are in both a technical and non technical domain and uh, what i resonate with you is your your vari variation of the experiences you have like you have been in the upper management of a major aeronautical and defense manufacturer and later you and your endeavors in the defense consultancy and uh, you are also a filmmaker and uh, you have a uh, like a profile as an author that you contributed in the national newspaper so what advice will you give to the indian youth uh, out of your life experience i think uh, nisar most important it is that uh... the opportunities that are available to you today particularly to our youth today are far much more than what we had um so whatever is your interest area somewhere something you like just try and do that uh, i think that will carry you forward i am not an engineer i am a post graduate in mathematics and of course uh, i am a lawyer uh, that way but what i say is that that today in all these uh, jobs also you are not only taking science graduates in america and all it's a mix of everything as you said the profile of your uh, students and colleagues up here so you what you like where is an interest somewhere at a certain age you know where your interest lies try and pursue that that will take you forward i come from a very remote hill station in assam i didn't have the uh, you can say information also when i studied about what all availability was it's just that at uh, 
certain stage of life i came in delhi i got to know a lot of stuff but what happens is that you have to keep uh, uh, a steady interest in what you like and then you can grow i typically work initially in the uh, it industry but then i moved to the defense and the cusp of uh, defense and it today is absolutely intertwined 20 years back people would have just uh, you know said okay they are there maybe some area today every equipment every new equipment today is uh, coming up with the uh, usage of ai you know the tank that you see on the road uh, 10 years back it would have been a completely you know command and control structure but everything worked internally today ai determines even what is in a you know tank the performance so fighter aircrafts and everyone the chips and everything that are getting sophisticated away. so there is a lot in this space for you all to do and i'll just tell you uh, last uh, semester i was at uh, indiana university bloomington in us i was uh, doing research and also occasionally teaching or taking classes now there was a variation of students from law background from computing background from international relations background uh, from economics background so everyone was also talking around this whole tech economy the chip economy the chip geopolitics all of that so today uh, you know our base of knowledge for everyone has increased more than what possibly 20 25 years someone had so you have a flair and i would say that you know through social media, even if it is flooded with misinformation also, but you get a lot of information that because it comes to you, you try to listen, you see, so your base is far much at an elevated uh, place. Hence, somewhere you have an interest which would not necessarily have been related to what you studied or pursued. Never mind. Take up a call around what is an interest to you. You do, somewhere you will see that your success is far <laughs> better when you do something what you like to do that's what i did i worked i also had uh, always an interest around policy matters i always pursued my writing talking etc i always had a desire to do some historical related documentaries I, you know yes. directed as well as produced uh, things around history that would uh, be you know perennially important uh, for you know mankind when they look at how geopolitics have been shaped so just pursue what you like to do today the opportunities are far much more and available and wider for you to take a decision but take a decision around what interests you yes sir so sir thank you very much for doing this and uh, we are really grateful to have you and uh, we expect that we can host you again for another interview maybe not on this topic on something on defense and strategy the, the sure. core uh, your uh, sure Mr. thank you very much and all the best to all of your colleagues and listeners thank you